Hi, and welcome to According to Pete for uh, the beginning of August 2017 or something like that, whatever it ends up being. Um, Wi-Fi has always been this big black box to me. And what I mean by that is I've never really had to give it much thought because it was just another means of transmitting data wirelessly from one location to another. And most of my projects tend to be really localized, right? So I'm not, I don't usually go for something that's as high level as Wi-Fi. I go for something that's point to point where I control everything in the link. Um, but uh, consequently, I would get sales reps coming in here going, Pete, man, you gotta get in on this new Wi-Fi spec. It's gonna be amazing, man. We got this vendor and that vendor. And I'd be like, oh, geez, really? I guess I, 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 I gotta get on that. So, um, but I found uh, uh, a lot of the uh, explanation videos that you find on YouTube for how Wi-Fi works don't tell you anything about how Wi-Fi works. Uh, they tell you like really high level things that you may not care at all about, that I don't care about. Um, so this video is a primer of uh, how Wi-Fi works. And it's a really broad, huge topic. Um, so we're gonna go about an inch deep on something that's really, really deep. Um, and we're gonna try to do it in 20 minutes or less. So let's see if we can do it. Okay, so first, uh, some history. In 1983, two different groups uh, working independently, and those groups were the International Organization for Standardization and the International Telegraph and Telephone Consultative Committee. I hate that word, consultative. Um, they were working independently, and they uh, independently created um, similar documentation around uh, creating a network standard that would uh, operate independently of any underlying hardware, right? Uh, and so in 1983, these two independent projects were combined into what became the Open System Interconnection Model or the OSI model. And I don't know about you, but when I think of OSI, I think of Brock Sampson. Okay, so the OSI model. What it is, what it does, is it describes layers of functional abstraction in uh, a networking protocol. And the layers, as they are, uh, application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical, okay? Now, the gist here is that um, each layer takes orders from the layer above it and gives orders to the layer below it in order to get something from one point to another. The physical layer represents bare metal. So this is like the, the, the module, the hardware that you're actually functioning with, okay? And the application layer is like the highest level out where um, somebody's writing an application and they are only you know, going down to the, like, give orders to the next layer and it all filters down and this is the actual bare metal, okay? Just wanna get that description out. All right, the next thing you need to know uh, chronologically um, is that, I think this happened in 1985? Um, the FCC releases um, the Industrial Scientific and Medical Bands, um, the ISM bands, for uh, commercial unlicensed use, okay? Um, and only, it's, it's a whole group of uh, frequencies. Um, and only a few of them actually apply to uh, Wi-Fi specifically, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So, now enter IEEE 802.11, okay? Now, if you didn't already know, and you probably do, uh, IEEE stands for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and they boast something like 420,000 members, according to Wikipedia. Uh, this is just, you know, for your background information. And if you want to join and have a say in all kinds of things, it's 200 bucks a year if you are a working professional in the United States. If you're from another country, it's less money. If you're a student, it's way less money. Uh, but I don't know about you, 200 bucks is like a big chunk out of my toy budget, so I probably won't be joining the IEEE anytime soon. Um, nonetheless, uh, there is a group, the 802 group, which handles LAN slash MAN specifications. And um, so 802 refers to them. 11 refers to Wi-Fi specifically. So everything that has to do with Wi-Fi specifically is under 802.11. That's what that means. Um, now, also, uh, I should tell you that Wi-Fi is, um, it's a trademark, right? Or it's a cop, no, it's not a copyright, it's a trademark. 
Um, and it belongs to the Wi-Fi Alliance, who actually didn't get formed until 1999, which is a couple of years after the first episode. Uh, we'll get to that in a sec, okay? Um, but Wi-Fi Alliance holds the trademark of uh, Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi brand. And if you want to put out a Wi-Fi product, you have to get it certified by them. I'm sure that's a boatload of dough. 802.11-1997 um, was the first effort by um, the 802 group for dot 11, okay? Uh, that was in 1997. The Wi-Fi Alliance, uh, again, got formed in 1999 and they hold the trademark uh, of Wi-Fi. And going back to the OSI model, right, OSI, um, it actually only refers, or the 802.11 only refers to the two lowest layers of the OSI model. Uh, those being the physical layer and the data link layer, right? And these together are, ref are what's referred to as the Wi-Fi stack, okay? Everything else is like higher stack, but when they talk about the Wi-Fi stack being on a module or something, this is what they're talking about right there. So the 802.11 group, uh, what they do is they periodically release um, an amendment Right? And every few years, they will take all these amendments that they release and they will roll them up into uh, the standard proper, okay? And uh, the ones, the amendments are the letters that you've become familiar with, like the B, the G, and the N, right? But those are by no means the only ones that exist. There is A, which has become obsolete, B, G, N, A, C, A, D, a, F, A, H, A, I, A, J, A, Q, A, X, and A, Y. And most of these are out in the world um, that you don't necessarily hear about. The big ones, B, G, N, those are all over the place. Uh, maybe A, C a little bit. Some of these are future releases. Um, but the whole point of these, uh, the, the reason they release these amendments is to keep up with um, industry demands uh, and uh, technical, technological advances, right? So when the tech gets better and faster and somebody develops a new way to do it and it gets better and faster, they will make an amendment around that, okay? And um, all these different specs can have, they, they, they all refer to uh, you know, channel spacing, different channel spacing, different frequencies used, uh, different modulation type, different data rates. So all of those are contained within each of these specifications. And not all of them have been widely adopted the way that like B, G, and N have. Uh, or their applications are a little more esoteric perhaps. But uh, the ones that you have heard of, BGN and maybe AC, that's where we're gonna focus, okay? Now let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, when I think of 2.4 gigahertz, I think of Wi-Fi pretty much all over the place. Um, but in fact, Wi-Fi operates on other frequencies as well. Now point, for 2.4 gigahertz, uh, you have B, you have G, you have N, um, and then you have five gigahertz. Five gigahertz, and can also optionally support, right? Uh, and AC, right? 802.11 AC runs on five gigahertz exclusively. Uh, and then there is AD that runs at 60 gigahertz and AH that runs at 900 megahertz. Now each of these frequencies has uh, its own propagation characteristics, uh, bandwidth requirements, given the data rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but these are all still all ISM bands, right? The industrial, scientific, and medical. This is this is part of all that was released by the FCC back in 1985. And uh, Wi-Fi is expanding into these other frequencies, but they're still largely in the 2.4 and some five gigahertz action. So for the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, uh, there are 14 channels officially. Uh, only 11 of them are active in the United States. Channel one center frequency is at 2.412 gigahertz. The channels are spaced in five megahertz increments up from 2.412 gig. The channel bandwidth is 22 megahertz, right? And when they define that, what they say is, okay, when you're 11 megahertz out from your center frequency, you gotta be 20 dB down, okay? But that's a whole lot of overlap, man. So the way they deal with that is largely uh, different uh, transmission types, different modulation schemes, lots of error checking, and making sure that your access points are well spaced apart so they don't interfere. And I'm way over oversimplifying when I say that, but in the general sense, that's how they kind of deal with it, all right? Now, speaking of different transmission types, um, 
There's some wacky stuff going on here, and I'm still wrapping my head around the different techniques that are used. But let's see how we do here. Uh, the first is DSSS, or Direct Sequence Spread Spectrum. Um, and that one applies to 802.11b uh, and G for some data rates. Um, and the way this works is they will take the outgoing signal and they multiply it by a pseudo-random sequence of ones and negative ones at a much higher rate than the original signal, okay? So what that has the effect of doing is spreading out the data, right? It's a much larger bandwidth and it makes the channel basically look like noise, like a lot of noise. What happens is that any actual noise gets swamped out by the big noise that is actually the signal. Um, and then at the receiver end, what happens is they take the same pseudo random sequence of ones and negative ones and they decode it and they get the signal back. And this has the effect of uh, making the channel much more resilient to the actual noise that happens there. So after DSSS, we have OFDM, which is Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. This particular um, transmission type applies to 802.11g and n, but n has a little twist, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the gist of how this one works is rather than using uh, the full channel width for a single data stream at a very high rate, what they'll do is they'll break it into several sub-channels at lower data rates, okay? And so with a lower data rate, you get better range and better accuracy for your data. And then at the far end, at the receive side, they recombine all of that to get back the original signal, all right? Um, now what this also allows is to have uh, guard intervals between the bits, which helps to reduce inner symbol interference, which makes it more resilient. Now, the reason it's called orthogonal is because these individual channels are spaced in such a way that their peaks don't interfere with each other and their sidebands don't interfere with each other. And so it's orthogonal, right? They don't interfere, right? It's, it's, just, it's orthogonal, it's not orthogonal. Um, but that's how it's supposed to work. That's why it's called orthogonal. Now, the only other thing I wanna talk about with regard to OFDM is to mention MIMO OFDM, which is multiple input, multiple output. Uh, the difference between regular OFDM and MIMO is that you have physically separated transmit antennas, and presumably that means physically separated transmitters as well. Um, each of those uh, individual antennas handles one lower rate data stream, okay? Um, now with this method, supposedly, and I won't lie to you, I'm not sure how this works, but it utilizes multipath where in previous incarnations, uh, multipath is something to be dealt with, right? But MIMO OFDM is supposed to use multipath to its advantage. I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, now, MIMO OFDM applies to 802.11n and AC. Uh, specifically, um, N has four separate streams allowed. AC has eight separate streams allowed, okay? So AC is capable of some crazy high data rates. All right, now let's talk about actual modulation of the carrier frequencies. Um, and if, if you've been bumming out about how much I've been glossing over stuff up to now, this is really gonna be a gloss over because each of these things deserves its own video. It's, its own 20 minute video to compress everything that people have worked years for into something that's really a travesty. Anyway, so um, modulating the carriers, uh, there are several techniques used. There's BPSK, which is binary phase shift keying. There's QPSK, which is quadrature phase shift keying. There is CCK, which is complementary code keying. And there is QAM, quadrature amplitude modulation. Now, as I say, each one of these deserves its own video and, and an explanation, and you're not gonna get any of it here. But uh, QAM, holy cow, look that one up if you don't know what it is. It's pretty amazing, representing you know a great number of bits with a single symbol. Um, pretty cool. Uh, amazing to me that it works at all, quite honestly. 
But um, what you need to know besides that these are the primary uh, means used is that they all get used at various times uh, for the best data rate achievable given that, um, you know, given whichever standard you happen to be operating on, uh, given the distance between uh, your access point and your station, uh, given physical obstructions like shelves, walls, blah, 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 uh, traffic that's already in the air, etc. I don't know what etc. is. Okay, so let's talk about um, the back and forth that happens between your router and your laptop, okay? Um, and this is even bigger and more convoluted than uh, the previous topics that I've glossed over, okay? In my research, this is the point where I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna lay back and let the bus roll over me, because this is getting too huge. But we're gonna do it anyway. So, um, if you look on the internet for the, uh, the, the connection sequence, uh, over a Wi-Fi network. It looks, a generic version looks something like this, where you, uh, station, that's you with your laptop off, like having a latte someplace. This is your access point, right? That's, that's the router. And what happens when you connect? Uh, you send a probe request, and all this happens without any knowledge by you. Probe request, probe acknowledge, authorization request, authorization acknowledge, association, and I'm not exactly sure, what, I mean, authentication, I get that. Association? We're already talking. Why aren't we associated? I don't get it, but that's fine. Uh, and then some magic happens. You have data and it's Wi-Fi and it's all happy rainbows and unicorns. Um, now, this isn't actually what happens. What, what, I've, uh, what I've learned, and I'm still learning, is that after the association acknowledge, there isn't ma well, there is magic. Uh, there is some greater level of authentication that occurs, and it's a much deeper subject than we're going to talk about today. I'm definitely going to leave that for another video, if ever. Um, but it uses EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, and what it does is it utilizes an external server called a RADIUS server. And so, picture this, right? The RADIUS server is like this guy that knows everybody that you know and can catch you lying, right? And it'll say like, no, you can't connect to that, right? So you say, uh, can I connect? Uh, I know this guy. And then the access point goes to the radius server and says, uh, he's calling and he says he knows, um, Bob. And the radius server says, Bob? I don't know, Bob. No, tell him he can't connect. And then he goes back and says, ah, oh, you, you can't connect, sorry, man. No, 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 I know Stacy, I know Stacy. So I kind of picture it like that. I'm sure it's not like that. I'm sure I'm dumbing this down to a point that's gonna make everybody cringe, but there it is. So um, in essence, this is sort of the back and forth that occurs. And after you get through the authentication, then you get the magic and you get back and forth. Let's talk about uh, the actual frames that go back and forth between your access point and your station, okay? There are three main frame types. Uh, there's a control frame, there's a management frame, and there is a data frame. Control has eight, eight subtypes. Management has 12 subtypes. So for data frames, I'm gonna go just a little bit deeper. It looks like I'm going really deep, I'm not. There's no possible way to go really deep on this uh, unless you're in it for a full semester. Then you can go deep. Uh, today we have three minutes. Uh, generic data frame, so if you look on the internet, you will find this generic data frame for Wi-Fi. Uh, and I will break this down just a little bit. Um, the sections are thus, the first two bytes are a frame control section, then there is a duration ID for two bytes, first address, six bytes, second address, six bytes, a third address, six bytes, then there is sequence control for two bytes, and then there is an optional fourth address at six bytes, after which comes the actual data itself, the frame body, and that can be anywhere from zero bytes to 2,312 bytes, right? And at the very end is a checksum that is four bytes, okay? Now, the thing you need to know is that any one of these fields um, or various bits within them, potentially, can have different meaning and different function within the scope of a data frame based on the bits that occur in the frame control field. So they can mean different things. All that said, there are actually 14 subtypes of data frames. 
Might be a 15th, I'm not sure, I had a typo. All right, so the last thing I wanna to touch on um, is higher level, <laughs> even higher level than where we've been. Um, and I wanna talk about the specs and their data rates, yada, 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 all the things that you kinda of need to know generically, right? So 802.11b runs again, and I covered some of this earlier, but again, uh, runs at 2.4 gigahertz, up to 11 megabit per second, gets you about 35 meters of distance indoors. G um, will also run on 2.4 gigahertz, will get you up to, up to 54 megabit per second, also about 35 meters uh, indoors. And then of course that depends on all your environmental factors that we talked about before. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that I'm being very careful to say up to such and such data rate. And the reason of course is because these data rates are very rarely realized, especially when you get to N. Now N um, again runs on 2.4 megahertz, uh, five megahertz optionally. They don't have to support it, but they can do it. Uh, and also remember this runs uh, the MIMO OFDM and uh, what they say is it'll get up to 600 megabits per second. Megabin? Megabin. You get 600 megabins per second. I don't know what that is. Um, but you can also get up to 70 meters indoors. So much improved, theoretically. So then there are a few more specs that are out in the world. Um, but these are kind of different animals, right? Uh, starting with AC, which was 802.11ac. I gotta say the whole thing so everybody understands. AC was adopted in 2013. It operates exclusively in the five gigahertz range. It can get up to 1300 megabit per second. Now remember, AC is sort of like super N in that it runs uh, MIMO OFDM. Um, but uh, being that it runs at five gigahertz, uh, it doesn't propagate so well, right? I've got a little experience with like my, my drone video stuff running at 5.8 gigahertz. And I can tell you five gigahertz does not go through much of anything. So um, your, your range comes down to about 35 meters again. Uh, and if all the stars and planets are in alignment, you can get up to 1300 megabits per second. Um, then there is AD, which was adopted in 2012. 2000, or, uh, AD runs at 60 gigahertz, can get up to 6.7 gigabits per second, right? Who would need that? Somebody needs it. Um, but if you're having trouble getting propagation at five gigahertz, I can tell you 60 gigahertz is going to be much, much worse. In fact, your range is down to three meters. Um, I can't see an application for that in my own world. I'm sure there must be one somewhere where um, a wire is not conducive, whatever. Um, but that's AD, adopted in 2012. Then there's AH, is the last one I will touch on. This is very recent. Um, I'm not sure if it's been fully adopted or not, but uh, the date for association is 2017, brand freaking new, runs at 900 megahertz, can get you up to 347 megabits per second, which not too shabby, right? And the cool thing about 900 megahertz is the range. Now, I didn't see an exact spec, well exact, right? They're gonna be exact. But uh, I think for 900 megahertz, we're talking about miles worth of range. So that's pretty useful. Um, assuming it doesn't come up against like LoRa stuff that sinks it in the market and such like that. Uh, there is some speculation that it won't be very competitive, but I'm not gonna go into that argument right now. Um, and I'll stop there. These are uh, most of the specs that you're gonna run into in day to day uh, or not, as the case may be. Um, and these guys, while they're out in the world, they haven't been fully adopted by industry uh, or consumer goods uh, for a variety of reasons. So I'll stop there. So that's it. That's where we're gonna stop today. Uh, hopefully that gave you a bunch more information that you didn't have before without bogging you down with everything that you may not necessarily need to know. For all you hardcores out there who know this topic inside and out, if I've missed something or was erroneous anywhere, please chime in down in the comment section uh, and let me know where, where I need to correct. Um, yeah. It was fun. It was crazy. That was a lot of research for me. Uh, it was a good time. So I hope you dug it too. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and checking it out. 
until next time, if you got uh, comments or questions or suggestions for future videos, please don't hesitate to put them down in the comment section below. And I guess I will just see you next time. Bye.